Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I, uh, um, we're going to start tonight's presentation with a PowerPoint, and then we're going to invite the public to look at some maps that we have posted on the back, back wall here. But uh, we appreciate uh, everybody's um, participation and interest in this study. Um, we are here for the public information session for Dogwood Elementary School uh, boundary change process. So um, I am Matthew Cropper I'm with Cropper GIS Consulting based out of Ohio. We work with districts all over the country in this, this kind of work. And, um, and we are here to help facilitate this process and guide the committee through their work and, uh, and, and just enable them to be able to make informed and accurate decisions. So tonight's purpose is to learn how the community-based boundary study process has been working, to review draft boundary options for elementary schools in this study area, to complete online surveys related to the options to provide valuable input to the committee. And, and that's the most important part for, for those that are here and those that are watching this uh, and or maybe watching this as a, as a recording later, is that we really want you to participate in, a, in this survey so that the entire committee and staff and consultants can benefit from your input. So boundary change study, talking about that a little bit. A boundary is a line that defines a school attendance area. It's an area that basically designates if you, what school you are assigned to. The boundary change study process is guided by policy in Rule 1280. It's facilitated by an independent consultant with an, uh, an objective, from an objective point of view with some uh, national expertise, uh, driven by a community-based committee made up of principals, teachers, and parents. Uh, it's very important to have uh, people who are familiar with the study area around the table when we look at this work so they can give us perspectives on what traffic is like at 5 o'clock at night, um, where they see students walking to school, where there may be bottlenecks and things like that with, as it relates to traffic congestion or where they're seeing construction and things like that. This group, uh, through this study, um, uh, studies a lot of information and, uh, and, uh, and objectively examines the data, uh, develops options together as a group and deliberates and makes changes, on, makes changes on those options. And then and really prepares to engage a larger community uh, through a process, which is that's what we're doing here today. Finally, this, as a part of this process, this committee will be recommending a, um, a plan to be presented to the Board of Education. As I mentioned, Cropper GIS Consulting, is a, uh, we are the consultants working on this, and we work with districts all over the country. I've done a lot of work in Baltimore County as well, and are honored to, uh, to be working with the county on this endeavor. The committee is, uh, is here to represent uh, each school community. Um, we ask them to, su to suspend their parochial interests, which means we tell committee members to take off your parent hat, your principal hat, your teacher hat, and put on your committee member hat when you get around the table here. Think about developing a plan that best meets the needs of all children in the study area, knowing that it may not be a favorable uh, solution to you, yourself, or your community, um, but if it does help the greater whole and helps all students as a whole, it's something that, that the committee should consider. And we've been very proud of the working groups that we've had in, these pro in this process um, so far. Committee is expected on this process to meet four times between January and March. Um, and we are through three meetings, which brings us to tonight's meeting. This committee collaborates exclusively with each other, uh, but the public is always invited to come to these meetings. So in, as you see uh, future committee meetings, you as members of the public are welcome to come out to these meetings and observe and watch the work of the committee as they are, as they are doing their important work. And then uh, finally, the final result of this is to present a recommendation to the Board of, Board of Education via the community superintendent. So this is a preview of the timeline. You can see we started our work in January and we've been meeting, uh, we met three times as a committee and here we are at the public information session. We will be regrouping with the committee on March 20th to uh, study the, the results of the public information and further explore options to see if there are any adjustments should be made or even potentially new scenarios created. And then once that work of the committee is done, which it would be that fourth meeting and the recommendation is finalized, we'll go to the board process then, 
where we present the recommendations to the board on May 7th. The board will host a public hearing on May 15th, uh, which will be here at Woodlawn High School, where they'll invite the public to come and, 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 and express their thoughts and observations around the various, uh, around the recommendations with, uh, directly to the board. And the board is expected to make their decision or vote on a plan on June the 11th. So in the initial planning for this, uh, at, for this area in the southwest area, there was um, Chadwick Elementary is, is, is in the process of, of, of being improved and, um, and, uh, to, and expanded. Um, the, in the initial planning for the new Chadwick Elementary, a boundary process was anticipated for this area to help balance enrollment. So it was looking at the, potentially the, 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 the additional space at Chadwick can help some of the schools in this area as well. Um, but current enrollment projections do indicate that upon completion, Chadwick Elementary is not going to have a lot of extra space, not much additional capacity at all. And uh, there, the, the additional space that's being added to Chadwick is going to uh, help out the, the overcrowding problems that exist at that building right now, which is very overcrowded. So for this reason, a boundary process that includes Chadwick as part of this process is not supported because there is not an available space there to be able to help out some of the neighboring schools. But with that said, relief at Dogwood Elementary can be provided through a couple of relief strategies. One of them is to look at re moving programs uh, within the study area to free up some additional space in the region and then also make some boundary cha change adjustments between schools to help balance out the utilization among the schools. Um, by utilizing both of these strategies, Dogwood Elementary is going to receive some relief and capa uh, capacity relief. So you could see here, this is a little uh, general area map of the schools in this region. Chadwick sits in the middle here, and you could see it's over 150% utilized. Um, the additional construction there is going to just as I mentioned, is going to help resolve their overcrowding. Schools that are in yellow are 100 to 115% utilized, and that includes dogwood here. And then schools that are in green are 80% to 100% utilized, so that's Featherbed Lane. So you can see here between dogwood and Featherbed Lane, it suggests that there is some opportunity to help balance enrollment uh, by moving some areas from one way or the other to help make these more equitable and try to bring both schools close to close to the green as possible. <clears throat> Talking about those program moves that I mentioned, uh, some regional special education progr programs at Featherbed Lane will be relocated in coordination with this capacity relief study. As you saw, Featherbed Lane has some capacity right now, but the thought is to help, to help both these schools in this study um, as much as possible by relocating that program at Featherbed Lane it, it opens up an opportunity to provide more relief to Dogwood um, Elementary School. The calculations for all options include 15 fewer students at Featherbed Lane to reflect this program move. And then um, and as a result of that, <clears throat> it frees up some classroom space because that classroom, there's a classroom at Featherbed that's being dedicated to this program that, that has, houses fewer students due to the special program that's, that's being served in that classroom. With that program moved out, that makes that 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 can convert that that classroom or classrooms to um, a standard elementary classroom that can house a, uh, the, uh, the the uh, number of students that are in a standard classroom. So the impact on this takes the um, state rated capacity from Featherbed to si from 654 to 667. So that gives even some more space for us to work with in this region. Looking at the utilization, you could see that Dogwood is at, a, uh, before any program moves, is at 112% utilized, uh, rounding up. Featherbed Lane is about 92, 93% before any program adjustments are made. With those program moves and pulling some pro that program out of Featherbed Lane, you could see that the utilization of Featherbed Lane goes from 92% down to 88%. And that, that gives more, uh, more capacity to work with. You see Dog, Dogwood's 111, 112%. So this, this, this opens up an opportunity to try to bring schools as close to 100% or bring them as much capacity relief as possible uh, with a two-part strategy here. 
So our objectives in this boundary study are to provide capacity relief to Dogwood Elementary School primarily, to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity, and to support diversity among schools that reflects the community and the school system. So we have some rules to follow, and these are referred to as boundary study considerations, and these are basically what we orient the committee on and also the public, and we'll do the same with the school board in that when you're looking at different scenarios or different options for, for a boundary change to provide capacity relief, you step back and answer, answer the question, which scenario or which option is going to best adhere to these overall considerations and rules? And the, best, the, the one that best adheres to these is going to be the best plan. Um, so these are to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, so be mindful of where there are walkers in this, in, among schools and tr try not to, t if students can walk to school, if it's possible, try not to take away that opportunity for children. Minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned, so we don't have uh, that in play here and that there are, not, um, there are not students in this area that have been reassigned recently, but we are studying the impacts on students and how many students would be moved as a result of, of, of any option that's being considered. Make efficient use of capacity in affected schools. So try to make things equitable in terms of how much space is available um, among the schools in the study area. Not only look at the current number of students that are inside these uh, boundaries and schools, but also look at the long-term enrollment. So what's, what is projected for the, for the region? How do the schools differ in terms of projected enrollment? Is one growing and one declining? Or, um, you know, those are the things to factor in and be as proactive as possible. Um, understand the location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So um, looking at, um, at what the impact of your elementary adjustments are on middle schools and high schools. And so it's important to note that this boundary change study is only looking at changes, making changes to elementary schools. Middle schools and high schools will not be impacted as part of this process. With that said though, it's possible that with the boundary, an elementary boundary adjustment, um, the, the percentage of students that go to a, a middle school could change. So there could be, uh, for instance, you could have a lot of an, all of an elementary school feed into one middle school, but as we make changes to the elementaries, that area could be uh, actually split to a different middle school. And I believe that exists in some, uh, in, in the scenarios here that you'll find with, with this study in that it's not really uh, easy to avoid because the current boundary line between Featherbed Lane and Dogwood is the current middle school boundary line as well. So any adjustment that's made will create uh, a feeder pattern impact. <clears throat> Phasing in boundary changes by grade level for all high schools doesn't apply for this study. And additional considerations are use of geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways. Trying to draw the lines, uh, looking at major roads when you look at draw, dividing lines and things like that. And trying to just ensure the safety and security of students as much as possible by doing so. The committee has spent th uh, a lot of work uh, and hours working on this process so far. They have met three times since January and uh, spent many hours reviewing information. We have four draft options that have, been, uh, that have been developed and are being shared with you as members of the public tonight. Um, and all the information uh, that, has been, that has been studied by this committee is being shared with you as well. The committee has looked at a lot of information including the enrollment and capacity of schools, they looked at walk zones, they looked at the zoning and how the communities are laid out, which areas are industrial and residential, and um, student diversity and demographic data. A lot of information has been studied that helps support those considerations in Rule 1280. Um, it's important to note that all these options are draft and will be draft all the way through, the part, through this process, until, uh, not until the board approves a plan. Um, these are draft all the way through that, pro uh, through that process. So, Nothing is final until a board approves a plan. So the committee is charged to recommend one <clears throat> option to the, to the uh, community superintendent who will present it to the Board of Education. 
So uh, right now we have four scenarios. At the next meeting, we're looking at make, finalizing a recommendation with the committee, and uh, that will, the recommendation will be one plan that's being presented to them. And as I said, nothing is final until the board approves a plan. They, they certainly have the ability to make changes to the plan if they feel it is necessary. When you look at maps, you'll notice that there are black and white dashed outlines um, all over the map. These are basically what we call planning blocks. So we take the elementary areas and we break it up into small building blocks. Think of them as pieces of a puzzle. And as the committee works through the process, they can, they, 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 they're moving these planning blocks to one school or the other. When you look at the maps, you'll see labels that, should, that indicate the planning block ID number as well as the number of students that live inside each of those little small blocks. This helps enable you as a uh, committee and also members of the public to understand if I move this area one way or the other, this is how many students are going to go with it. And so as you look at the options, you can see where we've, where we've moved students from one school to the other. And think about, the look at with your local knowledge, look at the planning blocks. If you think there's a better way, something else the committee should consider, and maybe sh shift and adjust, move this planning block instead of this planning block, that's something that, that certainly is uh, that we are li willing to, to listen and, uh, and, and hear from you on your input. We do have uh, statistics that go with the maps. Uh, so all the statistics are posted on a plot on a large uh, piece of paper along with the maps. It's the same information that the committee has been looking at and relying upon when they, when, as they consider the, these draft options. A quick review of the statistics, you could see that this, this, these tables right here show you some information about the enrollment. Uh, what's the capacity of the building? How many students are coming into the school from out of zone? How many students are leaving? Um, and what's the, what's the, uh, the head count in versus uh, the, the enrollment with FTE as it relates to preschool? And, um, and, uh, and then, so, so th this, this is information that a lot of statistics are on here, but if you have questions, us as committee members or staff or consultants would be happy to help interpret for you. The, um, you start getting into tables that show you the estimated enrollment per each option. So you could see how many students are currently at the schools enrolled, and then how many students are anticipated to be inside the buildings in each particular option if that option were to be implemented. The next table shows you information in the same, it's the same data, but it's presented a little bit differently. This is uh, something that I prefer, the way I prefer to look at the data is utilization percentage. So what's the percent full of the building? So you could see what the current utilization percentage is of, of the schools and, and, and uh, understand the imbalance that exists currently. And then looking at each option, how we're bringing things, the committee is bringing things in closer, more into balance as it relates to the building utilization for, for the two schools in the study area. We do track percent minority, looking at the impact on demographics for, this, for, the, for any school. And as you can see, there is really no, uh, no impact on the demographics of the schools as it, re as it relates to uh, the adjust adjustments or any of the options that have been considered so far. Student impacts are shown right here. You can see how many students are impacted in any particular scenario. And then when you look at the bottom table, this just breaks down the totals here and tells you how many students are moved from one school to what. So in option one, Dogwood is sending 55 students to Featherbed Lane, but Featherbed Lane is picking up 18 students from Dogwood in option one. And uh, so you can see that's how you would interpret those impact tables. Then you can see feeder patterns here. This shows you the percentage of schools, uh, the school that feeds on the middle school. So Dogwood currently feeds 100% into Windsor Mill Middle School, and Featherbed Lane feeds 100% into Woodlawn. As I said, that current dividing line between Dogwood and Featherbed Lane is also the middle school line. So as we make changes and, and send students from Dogwood to Featherbed, it's actually creating a, uh, a split. So, so those students would be um, going to a different school um, than, than, um, than the majority of the population. It's not something that we can avoid as part of this process because we're focusing solely on elementaries and part of this process. But the statistics on the, on the tables will show you how many students are moved from, uh, from building to building as it relates to the options. Tonight's a gallery walk format. We have four options for you to, uh, to uh, evaluate and review. 
and uh, members of the committee will be standing around the map as well as myself and consultants. Uh, we have uh, Zoran here from our office as well and then uh, BCPS staff. We'd be happy to help answer any questions you may have and interpret the maps. Um, and it's important, though, that as, as, you, uh, as you look at this and as you share your thoughts with us, to please participate in the survey. We want to make sure that the whole committee can benefit from this survey and, um, and benefit from your feedback. There are also laptops in the back corner over here that have the surveys up. If you want to fill out the survey tonight, you can do so. But you can do the survey on any device in your phone. And I would encourage you uh, to share this information with your neighbors and friends and family, people who live in this area. Uh, anybody who cannot, could not make it to the meeting tonight can still participate in this process. So there certainly is uh, an opportunity even if you couldn't make it to this meeting tonight. This survey is going to be available all the way through midnight, March 13th. If you go to the BCPS webpage under construction, you'll see Dogwood Elementary uh, Boundary Change Study. It's on the left on the bottom, uh, near the bottom. And then in there, when you get, click on that link, you will see the survey information uh, in there for, to uh, locate where the survey is located. It's important as you, as you fill out the survey to try to give us constructive feedback. If you think that if you don't like an option, tell us why you don't like it and think of it in terms of those considerations. Uh, you know, maybe you're, you're taking kids, you're, uh, and your kids are crossing over a more busy road with this option, or I don't like this option for these reasons. Um, as it relates to those criteria. And, and even more importantly, if you feel like there's a better way to look at realigning the, map, the maps or re, uh, re adjusting the boundaries and you have some ideas or thoughts, please put those in the survey. That's something that we will study and look at. All the materials, if you're interested in looking at prior meetings, all those materials are shared uh, online and any member of the public can go and look at the meeting one, meeting two, or meeting three materials. There also uh, is a, uh, a video, the, all, of the, all of these meetings are recorded and live streamed. So all those videos, you can go back and look at those and, and study, study the work and, and catch up on the committee's work uh, up to date. If you want to look at providing additional input, input in addition to the survey, there's an email that's designated for this process. It's dogwood release study at bcps.org. You can send an email to that. And that email will be collected by the BCPS and will be disseminated to the committee. And we, will st we are tracking and studying that input as well. Next steps, um, after the public information session window closes on the 13th, we'll summarize your input in a, into a survey report. We will be sharing that with the committee and regrouping on March 20th. And then they will be looking at uh, finalizing the recommendation at that meeting. So it's possible that adjustments could be made. But I will be encouraging the committee, only make adjustments if it brings you closer to adhering to those criteria. And uh, don't make adjustments out of emotion. Like don't, don't, don't make a change because this number of people don't like this map. You need to make, stay focused on the objectives and the criteria. And that's the most important thing, uh, even though it may not be the most popular option. The board will be meeting, uh, be, uh, be receiving the recommendation on May 7th. May 15th, the board will have a public hearing here, like I said. Um, and then June 11th, the board will take action. So with that, we'll uh, invite you to go to the maps and look forward to talking with you about the maps. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, being here tonight and, uh, and look forward to seeing your, uh, your input on the survey. Thank you very much.